Welcome to week 11. In this lecture, we're going to look at the last two types of study designs with the highest quality of evidence, systematic reviews and meta-analyses. The objectives for this lecture are to describe the difference between systematic reviews and meta-analyses, to interpret flow diagrams for including and excluding clinical research in a systematic review, and um, to evaluate forest plots and funnel plots and meta-analyses. Let's start, um, as usual, with a clinical dilemma. In this scenario, you're an internal medicine pharmacist and your medical team has just admitted a patient with a heart attack, which occurred one month after starting the medication Vioxx. Um, by the way, you are practicing in the early 2000s. This is the fifth patient you've had with this outcome on that particular medication. So you bring this up to the medical team and they pull phase three trials, which indicate that Vioxx has no association with increased heart attacks. Relative risk is less than one, and these are randomized controlled trials, so the team trusts them. However, you look again for more recent literature and you find a couple of recently published RCTs which suggest that there is actually a significant increase in heart attacks on Vioxx. The relative risk is greater than one and all trials in this scenario are clinically significant. So both you and the physicians that you're working with are confused by the opposing conclusions drawn by the randomized controlled trials, which again are the highest level of evidence. So how do we proceed in determining whether or not there's actually an association? So this is where our final two types of studies come in, systematic reviews and meta-analyses. Let's first look at their structure, some of the statistics that they use, and the validity that we can draw from these types of studies. Looking back at our hierarchy of evidence thus far, we've covered everything from case reports through randomized controlled trials in this course. Now we're going to look at pooling evidence from these lower levels into what are called systematic reviews or meta-analyses. And these two are widely considered the highest quality of evidence that we can achieve because they're composed of multiple RCTs or multiple observational studies. So broadly speaking, a systematic review is a structured process for identifying and analyzing existing studies that address a specific research question. Um, it's also considered the gold standard for summarizing literature. There's a couple of different ways that you can review existing literature. One is that you can write a review article on a subject called a narrative review in which you're simply pulling studies that prove the points that you're making and it's sort of up to you to try to be as unbiased as possible in identifying all literature and in consolidating it in some sort of structured format. However, there's no requirements at all. What a systematic review is, is it provides a structured process which is essential to eliminate investigator bias regarding the research question and this is what really differentiates a systematic review from a narrative review. In a narrative review, for instance, pharmaceutical companies can pay a healthcare provider a sum of money in order to make their drug look really good in a particular light by only pulling particular studies. But a systematic review, we must pull all the literature available and account for every study that's been conducted to arrive at the most appropriate conclusion. Um, systematic reviews are the most effective in a couple of certain situations. One of them is that there are multiple strong studies are available, but their outcomes are not in perfect agreement, which leaves us a little bit ambivalent as to how we should proceed in practice. This is from our clinical scenario that we just discussed. The other cases in which they um, can be useful are to establish best possible estimates of magnitude of effect. Say that you have a lot of positive studies, but the relative risks are kind of all over the place. We can use a systematic review and meta-analysis to identify a more accurate magnitude of effect, and we can also use systematic reviews to examine subgroups from multiple smaller studies. If um, we have very small numbers of patients in a lot of different studies, sometimes we can combine all of those patients and see a truly statistically significant effect since we can pool different studies together. 
All systematic reviews do require an analysis of the underlying literature. Um, this can be qualitative, in which you just write down and describe what they found, or quantitative, in which we combine the results and perform a new analysis statistically. Systematic reviews, which use qualitative analyses alone, are called narrative systematic reviews or just systematic reviews. Systematic reviews, which include an additional quantitative analysis, so new statistics, are called meta-analyses. A uh, meta-analysis can be defined as the quantitative synthesis of data which combines information from multiple investigations to reach new conclusions or address questions that weren't possible on the basis of a single investigation alone. The real difference between a systematic review and meta-analysis is this new quantitative statistical analysis. A meta-analysis is essentially a systematic review plus more statistics. Meta-analyses um, have been compared to multi-site investigations in that they're taking data from multiple different studies, sort of like taking data from multiple different sites, and then combining the data to draw new conclusions. But unlike multi-site randomized controlled trials, um, investigators of meta-analyses are limited to the available published information. So we're not conducting any new patient research, we're not enrolling patients or gathering new data. We are just using existing data. Because of this, they cannot choose appropriate populations to answer the question of interest. What, where if we were conducting an RCT, we can add patients or add sites and sort of manipulate the study to address our question in the best way possible. With meta-analyses, we are limited strictly to the information that is available to us. So how might we perform a systematic review? Systematic reviews, like we already said, are very structured, so we need to follow particular steps. So step one in the systematic review is like any research. Uh, it's to define a focused research question. For our example, um, we might have the question, does Vioxx increase the risk of heart attack in adult patients? Then, also like other research, we would define eligibility criteria, which is our inclusion and exclusion criteria, and the outcomes that we're going to look at. So I want you to think of the PICO or the PCOTS framework. We want to know which population that we're looking at, which intervention or exposure, which comparator group, and which outcome. We also have to think about the timing and the study setting um, because at least for a meta-analysis sake, we don't want to pool studies that are too different from one another. We want to make sure that the studies are really looking at the same thing. Then we define and conduct literature searches. So we search every conceivable academic database to make sure that we're identifying every study that's been conducted on the subject. Um, then we have this giant pool of papers. What we would do then is we would review the abstracts really quickly. So we don't have to read the full papers at this point. We just review the abstracts and say, does this study meet my study criteria? Yes or no. If it doesn't, you can throw it away. If it does, then you'll save that study and you'll analyze it further. You can also search reference lists of studies um, in what is called gray literature. Gray literature is unpublished resources that are things like posters at conferences or conference abstracts or doctoral dissertations or all these other things that might contribute val valuable information but aren't available in databases. Then when you have your final set of studies that you want that meet your eligibility criteria and look at the appropriate outcomes, you would read the articles in full pick out the information that you're looking at and rate the quality of evidence. Then you would synthesize the data, and if your data is able to be pooled statistically, then you'd perform that analysis. If your data is too different, um, or the study's designs are too different, um, or they look at different outcomes, then you can't pool the data to do a new analysis, but you can still describe all of your results in a structured format. So that's kind of an overview of how the process works. So this is just a little bit more of a specific look at how we might perform a systematic review. In terms of establishing eligibility criterion and outcomes, we would simply say, well, in terms of study designs, I only want to look at randomized controlled trials. 
Or maybe you can say, I want to look at randomized controlled trials and observational studies. Or you can say, I want to look at everything. I want to include case reports too. But you have to decide on a duration that answers your study question. So are you going to limit yourself to greater than six months or can you go any time frame? You need to decide that up front before you start your review search. You need to decide on the sample size of the studies that you're going to look at and you need to decide which types of studies you're keeping. You may say, I only want to keep studies which look at heart attacks um, or I only want to keep studies that look at mortality. It just depends on the specific study question that you posed. And then what you do before you actually start reading the studies in full, you make a systematic data collection sheet so that you know when you read the article, you're pulling out specific information. It's really important to be thorough up front so that you don't have to go back into the article a second time and identify information you missed the first time, which is extremely time consuming and frankly, a total nightmare. Systematic reviews have specific guidance uh, called the PRISMA guidelines, which walk you through how to identify, screen, and then accept and include eligible studies for your systematic review. So identifying all the pertinent literature is the most important aspect of systematic reviews, right? We said that the narrative reviews can be very biased in that it's up to the investigator as to pick which studies that he or she wants to include in the review. A systematic review tries to get rid of this bias by being very structured in how we perform our review and literature search. And you describe it in such detail that ideally anyone else could perform this exact same search and would end up with the exact same studies. So as you can see in the identification section on the Prisma flow sheet over here, you can identify literature through databases by searching specific key terms, which you would record, and you can also identify other records through different sources, often referred to as gray literature. So you can identify all the, those sources, you compare them and remove any duplicate literature. Then you screen the records, exclude the ones that don't fit, and then you read the records in full and assess them for eligibility. You again, exclude the ones that don't fit. And then finally, you're stuck with the ones that are included in your qualitative synthesis. And at that point, you really decide can I pool my studies into a meta-analysis? If you can, then you get down to the studies that you're actually including in your meta-analysis. This is um, an example of what the uh, eligibility criteria um, might be used, and this was used in a recent systematic review. So some investigators at Wayne State um, looked to determine the efficacy of capsaicin cream and cannabinoid hyperemesis sy syndrome. Um, the data on this condition is very limited and there are varying conclusions that are drawn. Some people swear by it and some people say it's ineffective. So in that circumstance, it's good to perform a systematic review to try to pool the studies and say, what does all of the literature say in full so that I'm not just reading one study and being biased by that single study. So this is a small section of an Excel sheet you might create. Um, I just wanted to show you how thorough you need to be um, up front. So the inclusion criteria, um, they only looked at articles that were available in English in which um, they used capsaicin specifically for cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome and only pulled studies that reported clinical outcomes. Then um, they read the trials in full and they kept all of these data points in mind and pulled them out of the articles one by one. Here's an example flow sheet from that study. So 214 articles were identified through search of databases and in the gray literature. 50 were removed, which left 164 abstracts screened, which led up to 146 studies excluded. Then 18 studies were written, uh, reviewed in full, of which 11 studies were included for data extraction. And at this point, the investigators only had case reports and case series, so they couldn't perform a meta-analysis because there was no underlying statistics done to combine in the first place. So when a meta-analysis is not performed, a systematic review kind of lays out the findings of the review in a structured format for everyone to see. 
So this was the study design. Uh, this was the patient population. Um, and th there were the outcomes that they looked at. And so um, you need to include everything that was included, not just things that were positive or negative, to eliminate some of that investigator bias. A very important part of both systematic reviews and meta-analyses, but not narrative reviews, involves grading or analyzing in detail the underlying evidence. So this is really important as we know that internal validity varies widely based on study design. So if we're performing a systematic review and all we get is case reports and case series, then we can say that the data is of very low quality. Whereas if all of our data is from well-conducted randomized controlled trials, we can say that we have very high quality of evidence coming into our systematic review or meta-analysis. So I won't get too far into this today. You just need to know that grading of evidence is done. And evidence is graded on things like the quality or the internal validity of the underlying studies, the clinical significance of those findings, and any underlying biases in those studies. So there's a little table down here in the right-hand corner which show you some of the grade criteria, but we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. For now, it's just important to know that you must assess the quality of the underlying evidence in your reviews. Finally, we get to the point of the meta-analysis. So qualitative synthesis of data from systematic reviews simply involves displaying the findings and providing a brief synopsis of the studies in the results section of the paper. But what the meta-analysis does is it quantitatively synthesizes data by combining data from multiple studies and reanalyzing the results to obtain a pooled estimate of the outcome of interest. And be aware, this can lead to some unexpected outcomes. So let's say in our example here in study one, we um, compared Vioxx and placebo, and we found that the relative risk in this study was 1.15. So Vioxx increased the risk of developing a heart attack by 15%. In study two, Vioxx had an even greater association, increased association with heart attacks compared to placebo. 1.66 was the relative risk. But then when we do a meta-analysis and we're combining many studies, say we combine these two, and then we actually find out that the relative risk in our pooled estimate is actually lower than one, indicating that Vioxx would be protective against heart attacks when compared to placebo. So, Meta-analyses can sometimes lead to surprising results, but we'll look a little bit more in depth about how they're actually performed. It's also important to note for meta-analysis that in order for studies to be pooled, they must have certain similarities. So you need to have a sort of similar populations. You need to look for the same outcome or else you won't be able to pool studies if you're looking at different outcomes. And then uh, you need to have similar interventions as well. All of this together must be able to answer the underlying research question. There's something called heterogeneity, which reflects underlying differences in studies that will be discussed shortly. But if heterogeneity is present in a significant quantity, then we would not want to pool those particular studies. For meta-analysis, it's important to note that in many circumstances, not all studies on a given topic will be included in a meta-analysis. There are some meta-analyses that are called exploratory meta-analyses, um, and they simply look at all the literature in general, but more often we're looking at a hypothesis-driven meta-analysis in which we're choosing studies that specifically answer a research question. So if we have a lot of different studies, say we have 20 different studies and we break them down into four groups. One group is just young men who take Vioxx to prevent uh, colorectal cancer. Um, five studies um, are in older men who took Vioxx for arthritic pain, five in young men and women for post-op pain, and five in older women for arthritic pain. It depends on the question that we're asking, right? So if we want to know whether men or women are more severely impacted by Vioxx for arthritic pain, we'd probably only 
include study groupings two and four, because those studies can most specifically answer our question. But if we wanted to know more generally if Vioxx increases the risk of heart attacks across different populations, then maybe we would include all four studies in our analysis. So this is going to conclude the first video of this lecture.